All right. Well, let's get into the Word of God. Um, this week, I've had it on my heart. I've had this, just this prevailing idea that I want to preach about. Um, I've had it on my heart to preach on the approachability of our God. That God is approachable. You may not know this, but God desires more than anything to have an intimate, deep, personal relationship with you. He desires this more than anything. He is the King of kings, Lord of lords. He created everything. He sits enthroned in heaven. Yet he sent his son to this world to, to bridge the gap between us, sent the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts. Why? He desires more than anything to have an intimate, personal relationship with you. Amen? Uh, earlier this week, I was, I was just doing some study and, and um, looking at some different resources. And there's this website where there's, there's, there's resources for pastors. So it was like, you know, for pastors, by pastors, and it was this resource. And I was just looking at the website, and I noticed that the pictures of all the pastors, it was just this very, they were very formal, buttoned up looking, you know, pastors. And I, I remember just thinking to myself, that doesn't seem very approachable to me. I'm sure those guys are amazing, guys and gals. I'm sure they're amazing I'm sure the theology is amazing that they're teaching, and there's some good resources there. But I just thought the image of it looked not very approachable. And I thought to myself, that's not really who God is. God is very, very approachable. Um, He's approachable to the average person. Here's the deal. God has made himself approachable to all of mankind. Not just the super intellectuals, not just the rich, not just the famous. God has made himself available to you and to me. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29, it says this, brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Think of what you were when you were called. I, I can think of what I was before I was called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Paul's really building them up here, isn't he? <laughs> Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were, in, were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of this world to shame the wise. God chose the, wor- the weak things of this world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world, the despised things, um, and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. Okay? God came to make himself available to average people, people who were not influential, not wise, lowly people. Amen? Aren't you glad you're, maybe are you one of those people? I'm one of those people. I don't know about you, but God took me from, from nothing and brought me to where I am today. It's all because of him. God has set it up in such a way that it brings him glory to call the most unlikely people. He calls the most unlikely people and he qualifies them. He doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Amen? Okay. He has made himself available to all people. Religion does a good job of actually alienating people from God. Religion looks like, okay, here's what I have to do to get right with God and to be right with him and all these formalities. But it does a good job of actually doing the opposite. It alienates us from God. Religion is form without power. Religion is model without substance. Religion is formality without relationship. Okay, I don't want a formal relationship with the living God. Very formal. I want a personal, intimate, loving connection with the living God. Amen? And that's what is available to you, to all of us here today. I was just thinking <laughs> during worship, um, to the religious mind, what we were doing here, the audacity to believe that God can move in our everyday lives and to heal sick bodies, and that maybe a sickness or something that you're going through isn't just God trying to teach you a lesson. It's actually an attack of the enemy, and the kingdom of God wants that thing off of you. Yeah. Amen? See, religion doesn't have any answers. Religion just says, oh, you're going through this thing. Well, let's just figure out how, how you get through that thing, and God's going to teach you a lesson through that thing. No, we don't believe that. We believe in the kingdom. We believe that, that the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus came to give us life and life abundantly, and he wants to get that stuff off of us. And yes, there's grace to go through confusing, hard situations that we don't have answers for many times. Of course, there's grace for that. But, but uh, relationship has answers. Relationship has answers. Religion just has a formality without power. Okay? Religion leaves us frustrated in our self-efforts, our self-performance, and has no substance. The title of our message today is called Approachable God. He is the approachable God. He's the available God. Amen? He's the available God. I don't know about you guys, but um, 
I, I didn't grow up this way, but I know that some people did grow up and, and their father was so busy, he was never available for his kids. Listen, our Father in Heaven is not too busy. He's not unavailable. He's available to us. Amen? I want to be a father like that to my kids. Today, I want to, there's much more I could say about the approachability of God and how he's made himself available. But today, I want to go after one of the schemes that our enemy does to try to alienate us from God and alienate us from one another. 2 Corinthians 2.11 says that we should not be ignorant of the enemy's schemes. The, the enemy of your soul, he has some schemes. He has some tricks up his, up his sleeve. Okay, One of the uh, schemes that I have seen over and over, and I just want to call out and highlight today, is something that I like to refer to as the guilt cycle. Everyone say the guilt cycle. The guilt cycle is a perpetual cycle that keeps you alienated from God and alienated from the body of Christ. Okay, it perpetuates a distance that we feel in our minds between us and God. It says in uh, Colossians 1, once you were enemies in your minds because of your e evil behavior, but God has reconciled you to God, okay? So the, the separation we feel many times, it's not actual separation, it's separation we feel in our minds. Okay, let me, let me highlight what Satan's um, perfect scenario looks like in your life to alienate you from God. Okay, number one, a person is tempted by something. Okay, temptation in and of itself isn't sin. Okay, we know this because the Bible says that Jesus, this is why Jesus can empathize with this so well, Jesus was tempted in every way. So like, if you're tempted, you're like, God can't identify with this. No, Jesus was tempted in every way, yet without sin. Okay, a temptation in and of itself is not, you haven't sinned at that point with temptation. But let's say that you're tempted. And this is how people begin to fall into the guilt cycle. This person perceives that the temptation is produced by their own evil heart. And even if that's true, what they do and what you shouldn't do is identify themselves with the temptation. Okay, even if that's true, it did come from your heart. What you don't want to do is identify yourself, bind your identity to that temptation. So the first lie that people believe is this, lie number one. I am what I am tempted by. I am what I am tempted by. I am that thing, okay? Number two, they, let's say hypothetically that you or the person eventually follows through with that temptation and you engage in something that the word of God, the Holy Spirit, and your conscience says is wrong, Okay? Then the second step is that person identifies themselves with the action, with the sin itself. Lie number two is, I am what I did. I didn't just do that thing, I, I am that thing, okay? Having followed through, they now feel like God is angry with them, God is condemning them, and they identify themselves as the guilty, okay? And this is where the guilt cycle is complete. Lie number three is, I didn't do something wrong, I am something wrong. I didn't just do something wrong, I am something wrong. I didn't just make a mistake, I'm a mistake. Okay, I'm the mistake. That is guilt cycle in full circle, and then it begins to perpetuate and keeps you in that guilt cycle. Then when you're tempted again, you're like, well, I'm a, that's who I am. And then you follow through with the action. It's like, well, that's because I'm a wretch. And then you feel condemnation. Well, that's because God should condemn me because... Look what I did, okay? And that guilt cycle continues to perpetuate. I want to talk about today how to break out of that guilt cycle. Because listen, we all have struggles in our life. We all have temptations. But listen, the medicine is not to run from the Holy God. The medicine is to run to the Holy God. And when you walk with the Holy One, He will make you holy. He will help you to walk holy, amen? So, because He wants to be close with us. He's the approachable God. The end result is this person feels alienated from God and it repeats Listen, anytime you, are, you feel in your heart alienated from God or the body of Christ, there should be red flags going up all, all over the place. Okay, if there's something you did or, or um, you know, the enemy works overtime to alienate people from the body of Christ. You know, and as a pastor, I, um, we, we hold people like this. Like, we, you guys don't belong to us. You belong to Jesus. And we're so glad you're part of our church. And people transition from time to time. People change churches. People come, people go. Um, and we, we want to hold people like this, but there are times where it's like, I know that this person who just left the church is supposed to be part of this church. I know it's the enemy trying to alienate them from 
their friends and their family and the body of Christ here at this church. There are times I know that that happens. Because the enemy doesn't want you here. He doesn't want you sitting in these seats. He doesn't want you watching online. Why? Because this is what we all need. We all need each other. We all need to be in fellowship and relationship. Amen? Okay? So if this happens to you, realize it's the enemy of your soul trying to get you off your game. Listen, um, this is one, one, another thing I say to people who maybe they, if they leave this church or they come from another church or they're church hopping or whatever, um, follow God, go to the church he's calling you to, but, but stay there, be in that church. And, um, you know, people who move and go to their other cities, I'm like, what, what you need to do, first thing you need to do, find a local church. If you're moving, find a local church, stay in the local church, be in the body of Christ. Don't go six months or a year and not be part of a fellowship. Amen? Okay, so tonight we're going to talk about, or tonight, today, it says, it says tonight in my notes, how cute, <laughs> and I said tonight, today. Yeah, yeah, I was writing these notes at night, so maybe that's where it came from. You know, sometimes if church goes like totally perfect, I get uncomfortable, I'm like, this, things are going too well, you know, we got to have a little mess up every once in a while. A false transition and a... <laughs> anyway, if we're getting too perfect, we got to have some, something, something wrong here. All right. So the first step to breaking out of this guilt cycle I'm talking about is realize that the enemy of your soul is actually the tempter. Okay? If, if you get this one point, we'll actually all leave this place... Um, better off. Okay, let me illustrate this. Um, I could illustrate this in many ways, but I'll illustrate it with this. Um, have you ever had a dream, and in the dream you did something wrong? And then you wake up from that dream and you feel guilty about it. Has that ever happened to you? You're like, oh, I need to pretend with this dream. Um, uh, have you ever ruined your life in a dream? Like you, like you murder someone, you kill someone, you rob a bank, you get caught, like... Have you ever just ruined your life? I'm, I'm going to jail for the rest of my life in a dream. Has that ever happened to you guys? Am I the only one? Okay. And you wake up and you're like, oh, thank God, that was just a dream. <laughs> like you're so relieved to wake up. Okay. <clears throat> Generally, I think, because as believers, we know that God speaks through dreams. And I, God speaks to me a lot through dreams. Um, not so much my wife, but... Uh, generally, our first inclination is to take ownership of the dream. But it doesn't always occur to us when something like that happens in a dream that it could be the tempter, the enemy of your soul, trying to plant a seed into your heart. Um, I, I talked about this a couple weeks ago. I didn't preach last weekend because Leslie did an amazing job last weekend for Mother's Day. That was awesome. Really good word. If you didn't hear um, Leslie's word last week, make sure to go back and listen to that. But the week before that, I was talking about that the word of God is like a, a seed. Jesus talked about this. It's like a seed. We need these seeds in our heart. Well, listen, the enemy of your soul is also a seed planter. He wants to plant seeds into your heart, into your mind, that he wants to germinate, that will produce a harvest of unrighteousness in your life, okay? And so we need to realize he is the tempter. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let me, okay, I'm talking about dreams. Okay, so... Um, dreams come from one of three places. When you fall asleep, dreams come from one of three places. Number one, God. Obviously, I, I don't really need to qualify this. Um, we believe that God speaks, and there are many examples in Scripture where someone had a dream. Uh, Job 33, 15 through 16, it says this, In a dream, a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls upon men, while slumbering on their beds, he opens their, uh, the ears of men and seals their instruction. Okay? I love that God, it's like... It's like doing surgery. You have to put that person to sleep so they don't interfere with it, right? <laughs> Maybe I'm like that. God wasn't just, won't just talk to me during the day because he's like, you're too busy. I got to wait till you, you, you stop, okay? Okay, what do we do with these dreams? We heed them. We pray about them. We hold on to them, okay? If, if God gives you a dream. Um, where's the second place dreams come from? Um, many times, dreams just come from ourselves. We call these pizza dreams. Have you ever had a pizza dream? <laughs> Where you like wake up and you're like just laughing about this crazy, weird scenario. You know, I don't know. Pizza dreams. We all had pizza dreams. What do we do with these? Well, okay, so the Bible talks about these too. Ecclesiastes 5.3, um, it says this. For a dream comes through much activity, 
A fool's voice is known by his many words. Okay, sometimes we're just running 90 miles an hour. We're really busy. You go to bed. Your mind is, you know, converting short-term memory to long-term memory. There's a lot of things happening. And you just have crazy, weird pizza dreams. We, we have those sometimes. Not every dream is a spiritual dream. Sometimes we have pizza dreams. Okay, or NyQuil dreams, right? <laughs> <clears throat> you ever take NyQuil and then you're like, just have the craziest dreams all night? Okay, it's a NyQuil dream. Not every dream is spiritually significant. Some of them, what do we do with those? Well, we just, we laugh at them and kind of forget them, okay? <clears throat> but there's a third time that we have dreams. And the third place that dreams can come from is from the forces of darkness, the enemy of your soul. These kind of dreams are either temptation or intimidation. Typically, they're temptation or intimidation, okay? What do we do with these dreams? Sometimes you just ignore them, but usually you resist them. If you have a dream from, that's not from God, not from yourself, you know it's an attack, we resist these dreams. Um, I'll give you an example in my own life. Um, I've actually had dreams where I woke up and thought immediately, oh God, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't, that's not me, I didn't mean to do that. I felt like I needed to repent of some evil in my heart. One time the Holy Spirit spoke to me, he says, oh, that's not a big deal, that's just the enemy trying to alienate you from me. He's just trying to drive a wedge between you and me, just ignore that, it's not you, and just move forward, okay? The enemy of your soul wants to alienate you from God. If he plants a seed in a dream, it, many times it is to either temptation, intimidation, and it's designed to alienate you from God, okay? Now, l- disclaimer there. Let me give you a disclaimer. Sometimes we are opening the door for the enemy to wreak havoc in our life. So keep an eye on what you're, what you're watching, what you're looking at. Um, are, you, are you harboring bitterness in your life? Keep, keep um, tabs on yourself because sometimes we do leave the door open. I just felt like I needed to say that too. <clears throat> but realize this. Satan is the tempter, and we are in a spiritual battle. Matthew 4, 3, it says, The tempter came to him, came to Jesus, um, when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness. If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread, okay? The tempter, he's tempting him, and he's trying to get him to, um, trying to get at his identity. Um, 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, Paul says this, For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent out to find about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter might have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless, okay? The enemy of your soul is the tempter. Here's the application. If you're being tempted in an area, look and see if you're somehow leaving a door open, but don't take ownership of the temptation. This is one of the cheapest wins the enemy can get over you is that you take ownership of that temptation. Say, that's, that's who I am, all right? This is the first step in disarming the guilt cycle. All right, number two, suppose that you follow through with the temptation, you violate your conscience, you violate the word of God, you violate the, what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. <clears throat> I mentioned that the person stuck in the guilt cycle, they own the act. I am what I did. Okay, question, should you own the act? Should you own the act? Should you self-identify with the action? Well, the answer is yes and no. Actually, the answer is yes, but mostly no. Okay. Yes, in the sense that you have to turn away from it and repent of it um, long enough to say, I'm sorry, and have a course correction, but don't bind it to your identity. I am what I did. Don't do that to yourself. Okay. Um, Is that healthy? Well, it's not healthy if you act like nothing's wrong, but it's also unhealthy to take a particular struggle and identify it to yourself. There's a huge difference with this. Okay, um, the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, he actually, he actually did this. He blame shifts on himself, okay? He says this, Romans 7, 20. He says, now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. How would you like that if your kids came to you? Like, <laughs> did, did, you did you break that? And they're like, no, it wasn't me. It was sin living within me, you know? <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so what's the point here? I, I, I think Paul is saying, yes, I did that thing, but really it wasn't the nature and character of who I am. It was actually sin living in me, a struggle that maybe I have, but it's not the, my identity in Christ Jesus, okay? That stuff I did, it wasn't me. It's not my identity, okay? 
own your struggle long enough to say, I'm sorry, but then press delete and then move forward. Okay? The enemy of your soul wants you to stay in that place. Um, how, many, how many here have kids? Have your kids ever lied to you? <laughs> Never. I've been lied to by my kids, okay? Um, they're not, not perpetual liars, but it has happened, okay? If my daughter lies to me, I don't say, I try not to say this, you're a liar. I say, you lied, okay? Um, you lied, I won't stand for that, and you shouldn't either. Why? Because that's not who you are. You're not a liar, okay? What are we doing? We're calling people higher. We're not saying, you are the thing you did. We're saying, that's not who you are. Now, we want, now I want to call you higher into your true identity, amen? Your Father in heaven wants to do this as well, Okay? All right, so that's the second step in breaking the guilt cycle. The last step in breaking the guilt cycle is this. Number one, there's the temptation, and we identify with it. Number two, we mess up, and we identify with this, the mistake. Then comes condemnation, and then we own that condemnation too. Okay, question, does God have the right to condemn us? He actually has the right to condemn us because he is God. However... In his sovereignty, he placed the guilt and punishment and shame upon Jesus on the cross. Okay? Therefore, he has made some decisions in his sovereignty. Romans 8, 1 says this, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. What is condemnation? Condemnation is to make a judicial uh, pronouncement stating what punishment has been imposed on a person found guilty of a crime, especially in the case of a uh, heavy penalty or death sentence. You did it. You're guilty. I'm condemning you. You're a dummy. Get away from me. Okay, that's condemnation. <clears throat> and that's not the way God works with his children. If you're in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation for you. There's a big difference between condemnation and conviction. Okay, Holy Spirit does convict us. Condemnation pushes you away from God. Conviction actually draws us closer to God. God does have the right to discipline his children. In fact, the Bible says, if you're legitimate sons and daughters, you will be disciplined by the Lord. He does discipline us. So it's not as though that's not true. But listen, discipline is designed to draw you closer. Condemnation is designed to push you further. So recognize that. If, if you're in a season of God is disciplining you, that's fine. Let him discipline you. But realize it's not because he wants to push you away. It's because he wants to draw you closer. Amen? Okay. So if God is not the one condemning us, who is? The enemy of our soul or our minds, right? Okay, uh, let me give you an example. Satan is the accuser. Revelation 12, 9 through 10, it says this. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, uh, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before God day and night has been hurled down. He has been hurled down. The Bible calls Satan the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of us. Okay, here's the point I want to make. The same voice that tempts you is the same voice that accuses you. The same voice that says, oh, that's no big deal. Just go for it is the same voice that will then turn around and say, you wretched scumbag, you call yourself a Christian. Okay, that's an attack designed to alienate you from your father. Okay, the same voice that tempts you is the same voice that accuses you when you do stumble. And Satan wants us to come into agreement with those accusations, and it perpetuates this guilt cycle that I'm talking about. We need to be, co- we need to be very careful by the things that we come into agreement with in our life. <clears throat> Just because you had a thought doesn't mean it's your thought. Okay? Sometimes you have a thought and you're like, oh, that wasn't me. That's the Holy Spirit. Right? Has this ever happened to us? Listen, the opposite is actually true. Sometimes a thought, a seed, or something will drop in your mind like, that's not me either, and that's not from God. Amen? What do we do with that? We push it away and we say no. Amen? Okay? So, <clears throat> here's the guilt cycle. Satan tempts us, we identify with the temptation. I'm tempted because I'm a hopeless wretch. 
Okay, no, Satan is the tempter. Number two, you mess up, and after you mess up, Satan tries um, to wear you down by accusing you of the very thing that he was trying to tell you was no big deal in the first place. And then if he can, he will make God out to be the one who's accusing you. He'll make God out to be the one who's pushing you away. And then the guilt cycle has gone full circle and the alienation is complete. The Bible says, don't be ignorant of the enemy's schemes. And I believe this is for some, some ones here today. And I'll conclude with this. <clears throat> God wants us to have confidence before him. Confidence before him. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23, it says this, Therefore, brothers and sisters, uh, therefore, brothers, but this clearly doesn't say sisters there, but I'm sure it implies sisters, okay? Therefore, brothers and sisters, can I get a witness, sisters? All right. Therefore, brethren, we'll say brethren, and that'll include women. Um, Since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us um, from a guilty conscience, having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. God wants to cleanse you from a guilty conscience. He wants us to come boldly before the throne of grace by the blood of Jesus. Amen? All right. I want, to pray. I want to pray over this, and then I want to just tag one last thing on it, and we'll, we'll close here. Um, Father, I thank you for your, your sons and daughters in this room, Lord, that you desire to have an intimate, personal relationship with us. God, you are approachable. Whatever it is you're going through, you can talk to God about it. You can bring it before him. In fact, that is the medicine you, you need, is to bring it before the holy God. When you bring it before the holy God, he will walk with you and make you like he is. So Jesus, we just pray, make us as you are, make us holy, make us walk with you, Lord God. We thank you, God, that you wanted to draw us close. You wanted to draw us near. You wanted to have an intimate relationship with us. In Jesus' name, I bless your people with that. Amen. Last thing I want to say is that this is how we need to be. This is how we should be. The name of our church is City Lights Church. We want to be the lights shining out in our city. Let me ask you a question. Are you Are you approachable? Are you approachable to the weak, despised, foolish things of this world? Okay? I want us as a church to just, to be that. I want us to be approachable. God is approachable. And, and, you know, you you reflect what you believe about God. I believe he's approachable. Therefore, I want to be approachable. Amen? I believe he's loving, therefore I want to be loving. I, I believe he's accepting, therefore I want to be accepting, okay? And so I also want to just pray this and then, and then we'll close, that we would be like that. Are you approachable? Jesus, Jesus, you came to that, to those who were lost. You came to us. You came to reconcile mankind to you, Lord God. And God, I pray we would pick up that mantle, that you would give us, God, the ministry of reconciliation that your word talks about, Lord that we would be approachable, that we would portray the, the true nature and character of who God is, that we're approachable because you're approachable, Father. God, I just, I just pray for a, a hurting world who has mis, um, misunderstood who you are, Lord God. We would help this world break out of this guilt cycle and fall in love with you and walk in relationship with you, Lord. We love you. We bless you. We thank you for today. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you guys.